What is up, champion puppy owners? Do you want a streamlined ownership experience? Do you want a socialized dog with manners, responsiveness, and general life skills? Great, you're in the right place. This podcast is for the accountable puppy owner who wants to better know and grow their dog. Welcome to or welcome back. So what we're talking about on this week's podcast is chewing. So not just chewing for the sake of stopping it, by all means, we're going to talk about that. But on the flip side, we're looking to actually promote chewing because you know now that if you can get your dog to chew, you can have your dog fill the space between high periods of activity and your dog passing out. And remember, your goal is is to control your dog's day, not in a way that's old school and forced, but in a way where you're manipulating things smoothly, taking what we do on the field from an obedience train standpoint with food and gameplay, and then applying that to making sure that your dog keeps coming back to that bone over and over again. So we've used the champion chew meter, really just taking six of like the core most important bones or chewing items that I've found over my 17 years in working with dogs and breaking them down from softest to hardest, knowing that your puppy is going to be most prone, most want to chew the softer, more consumable bones because they smell better, they taste better, they're actually consumable so your, your puppy can get this bone in his belly quicker and it just makes it a more um, easier bone to get to stick. And so what we started uh, the week off was talking about some of the harder bones, the antlers, which there's both the whole and then the half antler. I typically try to get dogs hooked on the whole antler because if not, they'll chew out the marrow from the inside part of the bone of that antler And then from there, they might not chew the rest of the bone, or at the very least, even if they do chew the rest of the bone, they're going to move through it quicker. And it's just a better dollar per dollar investment if you can get your dog hooked on that whole antler. Then we talked about the cheek roll. We like that because it tastes really good for dogs. It's semi-consumable, but it's not a super fast consumed bone. So that's why um, if you're looking at this chart, it's underneath like the the um, the orange, right? So not red like the antler where it's, it's a lot harder to chew, but it's orange. But it really packs a punch in regards to keeping your dog's attention, even for a little bit of a harder bone. Then we talked about the yak chew, which is about somewhere in the middle. Then last podcast, we talked about the compressed bone or the rolled bone, which we talked about that compared to the, like the bleach kind of grocery store version of like the uh, rawhide. And now today's podcast, we're going to talk about gullet sticks and bully sticks, both from a cow, but from different ends of that cow. A gullet stick is, initially when I heard that, I thought, like, I tell my kids, like, like jokingly, but like, like throw that food down your gullet. You know, like, we're in a hurry, you got to get to school. And um, it is just that. It's, uh, it is the esophagus of a cow and it's hollow and it can be bought typically in either six inch or 12 inch. And they're consumed relatively quickly. They're not going to last all too long. And then the cousin to the gullet stick is going to be a bully stick. So I'll typically use a, a gullet stick with a smaller dog uh, because they are hollow on the inside. Or the bully stick, as, as mentioned, they are from the other end of, of that said cow. And they are a bull's penis. So yeah, with that said, you can get them in either 6 inch or 12 inch and normal size or jumbo size. Now, depending on your dog, these might be too quickly consumed if you do have a big breed dog that's an adult dog. So you might find that these are just very expensive and your dog can plow through them kind of like potato chips. But if you have a puppy, if you have a dog that's a, a moderate chewer, these these bully sticks might just be like the ticket to getting your dog past higher level distractions, as I mentioned before, when guests are coming over, when you're jumping on that web conference, keeping your dog up late so you can make sure that your dog is getting really good sleep. So you're getting really good sleep, right? And so these bully sticks, you want to take them away if your dog's going to consume them and then try to swallow them prematurely. Check out our website. For Bully Buddy, um, it's, uh, as I mentioned in a prior podcast, it's like this little plastic vice that you can put on there. So when it gets to the end, you are able to take away this vice that is attached to the small part of the bully stick. And then you can you know, move your dog onto a different bone or hook your dog up with a new bully stick. So just remember, 
You want to get your dog hooked on the hardest bone possible. That way you can use the full gamut of the champion chew meter, all six bones involved, and that way you have more cards in your hand to be able to play. You want as many bones as possible to pair your dog up with because it's just going to allow you more versatility in being able to glue your dog to a bone, even more importantly, having your dog habitually get used to chewing a bone so distractions can come about and your dog doesn't care. And so we're going to get this process to happen by doing umbilical cord training and really developing your dog's relationship with that bone and not just buying a bunch of bones and putting them on the ground. All these bones that we have, all six of them, we're going to put up when not in use. I think that's a very good thing to end this week's segment on is when you give your dog a bone, it is at a specific time in your dog's daily regimen and it's a specific bone and you're going to use a specific kind of confinement, whether it's umbilical cord training using a leash um, and we go over with you the actual technique to using that leash to pair your dog with that bone. You might use a particular dog bed. I'm a big proponent of raised dog cots because it creates a dichotomy between where your dog uh, is and where it shouldn't be, right where your dog needs to be and where it shouldn't be. Um, and it just allows you to better uh, build a boundary. And so that way you have the bone courting your dog to stay there because it should enjoy chewing it more than likely. And habitually, that's what you're trying to develop, as I just mentioned. And then you have um, the the surface difference where maybe it's on a wood floor or a tile floor and your dog's on that comfy bed. And then we have you there, the owner, with the leash. So the second that dog goes to um, put its paw on the ground or get up off that bed, boom, you're right there on your puppy, um, like uh, almost bum rushing it, creating a shock and all effect. So your puppy realizes, no, this is where, again, I need to be. But we work that out through sit stays. So remember, on the field, we're going to do sit stays. We're going to have your dog in front of you. And when it attempts to get up, we're not going to let it get up. Uh, now, we're going to reward your dog for staying there. We're not just going to do compliance and fear-based training, but we're going to uh, not allow, allow your dog to get up through verbal leash and body language, but we're also going to hook your dog for staying up so we can work on your dog's natural impulse control. And then we're going to apply that to keeping your dog what I call under my thumb. It's that under my thumb stance. And um, we have that in the champion stances and that's available for you in some of the different mini courses and definitely in our actual boot camp. I hope you got a lot from this week's podcast and you feel like you have six different kinds of bones that you can go back and utilize to bridge the gap between extreme activity for as long as possible and extreme sleeping for as long as possible in a confined situation, typically your puppy's crate until you develop your puppy out of the crate. With that in mind, check out championdogproducts.com. We have videos, descriptions, and staff there to help answer questions. If you have any questions about placing your order, we'll be happy to help. Make sure you tune in next week. We're going to be going over best practices in regards to confinement. So remember, confinement is going to help you with everything from um, behavior modifications such as nipping, chewing, jumping. It's going to help with potty training, separation anxiety, and just really the confinement is a great focus tool. It's not just used for you know putting your dog in a crate when you leave the home. Um, I really want for you to use the crate all day. Um, and in a very strategic way. So tune in, and next week, we're going to cover that topic in depth. Remember, champion puppy owner, action over anxiety, discipline equals freedom. Take the next step, do what you know how to do. Drive the puppy training process. Truly commit yourself to this and hit it hard for a short period of time so you can stop working on your dog and simply enjoy them. I'll see you next time.